Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here to talk about the fundamentals of statistical inference. In this video, we are going to cover hypothesis testing, sampling error, and confidence intervals. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, as I said, we are going to cover just the basics of statistical inference. Now, these topics that we're going through, which include sampling error, hypothesis testing, and confidence intervals, will... I can't believe a bug just landed on my face right as I was talking. Must be the beard. Honey, a bug just flew in my mouth as I was talking. Yeah. Now we're going to cover the topics of sampling error, hypothesis testing, and confidence intervals, but it's just going to be an overview of those topics. We'll get into them deeper in future videos. But in today's video, we're just going to introduce them so that you know what they are as we start to encounter various statistical techniques. Now this information comes from chapter seven of the textbook, Statistics in Kinesiology by Vincent and Ware. Now we've already encountered this idea that we most likely will never be able to measure any aspect of the entire population. Instead of doing that, we have to take a sample, usually a random sample if you can manage it, from the population and then infer characteristics of that sample to the broader population. And this is what is called inferential statistics. This is the process of estimating population parameters based on sample statistics. Now, the statistic is what we calculate on the sample, and the parameter is what we infer that to regarding the population. So the mean of a population or the standard deviation of a population, that would be a population parameter. But when you are taking the mean or the standard deviation of a sample, that's referred to as a statistic. Okay, and we have those two definitions down here. Parameter is a characteristic of a population, while the statistic is an estimate of a parameter based on a sample value from the sample. Now, when we are conducting statistics on samples, we need to estimate the sampling error. Sampling error is the amount of error in the estimate of a population parameter that is based on a sample statistic. And we can estimate this using what's called standard error of the mean, or SEM. SEM is an estimate of the amount of error when a sample is used to estimate the population mean. We know that the population mean can never truly be known. Nobody can go out and measure every single person in the desired population, or at least usually they can't do that. But we do know the sample mean and an estimate of the error that we should expect. So here's a little thought experiment. Let's say that you wanted to calculate the mean value of a group of males at a university. Now this has come up in previous videos. Um, in this case, we have 1,500 males, and we can only measure 50 of them. So in this case, we, let's say that we know, somehow we know that the population mean is 175 pounds, and the standard deviation is 25 pounds. And recall that using percentiles and z-scores, because this data is normally distributed, we know that 68% of all scores fall between 150 and 200 pounds, or 68 and 91 kilograms. That's one and negative one standard deviations above and below the mean. And 95% of all scores fall between negative two and two standard deviations above and below the mean. Now let's imagine that we somehow have access to all of the scores in this population. So you have all 1500 of these males and you are able to have all of their body masses in a spreadsheet, and you can just grab 50 scores at random from the overall set of 1,500. So you pick 50 scores, and you calculate the mean. And then you return those 50 scores, and then grab another 50 and calculate that mean. And you keep doing this, calculating more and more means. This would actually create a frequency distribution of all of those sample means. So let's say we know this, that the population mean is 175. So let's say that 175 is here. And let's say this is 
180, and let's say that this is 170, and so on and so forth. And so you grab 50 scores, you calculate the mean, and it's going to end up right here at 175. You grab another 50, it ends up here, and here, and here, and so on and so forth. Except for more of the scores are kind of falling towards the middle because the overall population has a mean of 175. So it's more likely that you're going to fall closer to that 175. But each time you draw a score, it could be a little higher, a little lower, or it could be a lot higher or a lot lower. And so I'm doing my best to draw some sort of a frequency distribution here out of dots instead of out of lines. And so we could create a frequency distribution out of all of those sample means. Now the distribution of these means, if we plot them out, would be normal. This is due to what's called the central limit theorem. The mean of the sample means is equal to the population mean, and the standard deviation of the sample means is called the standard error of the mean. So in this, okay, so this thought experiment can be a little bit confusing, but let me try to explain it again. So you have a huge group of people, and you somehow know that their mean body mass is 175 pounds. And let's say that you could randomly draw 50 of those people, and you take the average of their body mass, and maybe it's 172. You put those 50 people back. You draw another 50. Their average is 178. You put them back. You draw another 50. They're 175.4. And you keep doing this over and over again. And maybe you do it 1,000 times, 10,000 times. And you create a frequency distribution of all of those means that you have calculated. Now, if the population mean is 175, then most likely, most of your means are going to fall pretty close to 175. But every once in a while, you're going to randomly sample a bunch of people who are much heavier than 175. Or randomly, every once in a while, you'll sample some people that are uh, much lower than 175. So occasionally, those means will be a little bit smaller, but that won't happen very frequently. The most frequent means will occur right around the population mean. And this will exhibit normal curve characteristics. Okay, if you create a frequency distribution, it will be normally distributed. Now, if we take the mean of all of those theoretical, theoretical means, it would be the population mean or the population parameter for the mean. If you take the standard deviation of all of those means, it's what we call the standard error of the mean. Now, this is what it would look like if we did that thought experiment and we plotted all of those means. And this is in kilograms, but right here is right at 175 pounds. Okay, so here is written down the population mean is 175, the population standard deviation is 25. If we took 100,000 sample means of 50 from this population, the mean of all of these 100,000 means would be 175, and the standard deviation of the sample means would be 3.25 pounds, sorry, 3.52 pounds, which is the standard error of the mean. But how did we calculate that? Because this theoretical thought experiment doesn't actually exist. We can't actually do that. So we actually need a way to calculate standard error of the mean. So the previous example was just theoretical. We don't actually have access to the population parameters, and we can't pull a sample 100,000 times. So in order to estimate the standard error of the mean, we use this equation. Standard error of the mean equals the standard deviation of the sample over the square root of the sample size. Now the awesome thing is that we can use this number to then calculate levels of confidence as well as confidence intervals and probability of error. So the level of confidence, or LOC, is a percentage figure that establishes the probability that a statement is correct. Now the probability of error, on the other hand, is the remainder after we have established the level of confidence. So the two together always add up to 100. So at a 68% level of confidence, there is a 32% probability of error. And if we add those up, they equal 100%. At a 95% level of confidence, we have a much smaller probability of error or um, at 5%. Okay, and again, these add up to 100%. Now we use lowercase alpha to represent the area under the normal curve that represents the probability 
of error or the error factor. If we use a Z table in this textbook, it's table A1, but it's also known as a Z table, we can determine why the Z score of 1.96 is an accurate Z score, more accurate than using a Z score of 2 for a probability of error of 5%. And this is just because on a normal curve, if we want to go, if we go out two standard deviations above and below the mean, we've actually gone just slightly too far and pulling back to 1.96 corresponds with 2.5% in each of the tails. So 2.5 and 2.5 and then 95% in the middle. So a confidence interval, to go a little bit deeper into this, it's the range of values associated with a level of confidence. So everything else being equal, increasing the sample size will make the confidence interval narrower. And if everything's equal, increasing the standard deviation will make the confidence interval larger. Okay, so if we have the standard error of the mean, which is equal to the standard deviation over the square root of the sample size, we can see that if this number gets larger, then the standard error will go down. If the standard error goes down, then the confidence interval narrows. If this number gets larger, the standard deviation or the spread of the data, if that gets larger, then the standard error goes up. If the standard error goes up, then our confidence interval gets larger. Now in statistics, we usually want to get as small of a confidence interval as possible at 95 or at 90% or whatever it is that we're establishing. As the researcher, you are the one setting the confidence interval around your parameter. Now, if you're establishing a 95% confidence interval and it's a very, very narrow confidence interval, that means that your data is either very tightly distributed, it has a small, a relatively small standard deviation, and or it has a very large sample size. So the n is very big. Both of those things, a small standard deviation and a large sample size, will help you to achieve a small standard error of the mean or a standard error of the estimate if it's a different statistic. And that will allow that confidence interval to be smaller. So the confidence interval, as we'll see here in a second, is the range within which you are 95% confident that the mean or that the statistic lies. If that range is really big, then you can then you're saying, I'm certain that it lies in here, but it's a big range, so it's not quite as precise. So the decision of which confidence level to use is based on the consequence of being wrong. So as the researcher, you have to determine what are the consequences of being wrong in my research. So for example, in medical research, an incorrect conclusion may result in serious injury or death to the patient, and so therefore we want a very, very high level of confidence. It needs to be greater than the typical 95% because we don't want to go to the patient and say, well, you know, there's a, a 5% chance that this may cause injury or death. 5% is low, so you're probably gonna be okay. We want something more like 99.9% .9 because any injury or risk to the patient is really unacceptable. Now, the, the unfortunate thing is that as we increase the level of confidence, we lose precision in the estimate because if we are expanding uh, that level of confidence, remember that on that normal curve, we're really widening the margin within which we are saying that we're confident that the mean or that the, st that the statistic lies. So the larger the confidence interval, the greater our confidence, but the lower our precision. Now the next topic to speak about is statistical hypothesis testing. This is where we create two mutually exclusive and exhaustive mathematical statements about the outcome of an analysis. So in any statistical hypothesis, we have two hypotheses, the null hypothesis, which is represented as H sub zero, and the alternative hypothesis, which is represented by H sub one. These are mutually exclusive. Only one of these two can be true. And they're also exhaustive. No other option can exist. So here's an example. The alternative hypothesis might be that there is a difference between two groups of individuals. Maybe you measure a group of females and a group of males, and your hypothesis is that there is a difference in body mass between these two groups. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis that there is no difference. 
null meaning zero or nothing. So there's no difference between the two groups. Both cannot be true. You cannot have a difference and no difference, and there's no alternative to those two hypotheses. One of them has to be true. So they are both mutually exclusive and exhaustive. So here's another example. We might hypothesize that biomechanists and exercise physiologists differ in their body mass index, or BMI. This is how we would write it out logically. So the null hypothesis, or H sub zero, is that the mean, the mean body mass of biomechanists equals the mean body mass of exercise physiologists. And therefore, the opposite of that, the alternative hypothesis, is that the mean body mass of biomechanists does not equal the mean body mass of exercise physiologists. So in this case, H sub 1, or the alternative hypothesis, is a non-directional hypothesis, meaning we're not hypothesizing about whether the biomechanists will have a greater body mass or the exercise physiologists will have a greater body mass. So there's no direction. We're just saying that there is a difference. Whether one is greater than the other, we are not hypothesizing about that specifically, but just that there is a difference. We could also, though, if we want to have a directional hypothesis, it could be something like this. The null hypothesis, biomechanists, the mean body mass of biomechanists is less than or equal to the mean body mass of exercise physiologists. And the alternative hypothesis to that is that the mean body mass of biomechanists is greater than the mean body mass of exercise physiologists. Then what we do is we proceed to test the null hypothesis. And then we either accept or reject that null hypothesis. Inferential statistics all revolves around accepting or rejecting the null hypothesis. And we do so at certain levels of confidence and at certain probabilities of error. Now we recall the idea of the sampling distribution of the mean. We can also extend this to the idea of mean differences. So assume you have the BMI score of all the biomechanists and the BMI scores for all the exercise physiologists. Let's also assume that the null hypothesis is true. So these two groups of individuals have equal BMIs. We take a sample of biomechanists and a sample of exercise physiologists and we calculate the mean difference. Okay, so we take a sample of each and let's see what happens. If the null hypothesis is true, and remember that the null hypothesis is that there is no difference between the means, then the difference ought to be about zero, right? But remember, if, if we are taking just a sample, there's going to be some sort of sampling error. Like we talked about at the beginning, the sample won't always be a perfect representation of the population. So due to sampling error, the mean difference is unlikely to be exactly zero. So even if, let's say that the entire population of biomechanists in the whole world, let's say there's 10,000 of them, and in the whole world there is 10,000 exercise physiologists, and let's say that if you took the average BMI from each of those two groups of people, they were exactly equal. Well, now let's say you take 100 from each group and you measure their BMI. It is highly unlikely that the difference will be exactly zero, and that's just due to sampling error. No matter how many times you do it, there will be very, very, very few times when the BMIs will be exactly equal. The differences will usually be close to zero in most of those cases, and in very few cases it will be somewhat far from zero, but it's highly unlikely that you're going to get it, get it exactly zero. Now, if we repeated this over and over and created a sampling distribution of mean differences, then the mean of all of these mean differences should be zero. Okay, so, oops, I just crossed it out. I should underline it. There we go. The standard deviation of these mean differences would be called the standard error of mean differences. So let's say that this is zero difference. This is a difference in one and two and negative one and negative two in BMI. And so it's going to be very rare that you get exactly zero, but you're going to get around zero quite a lot. And occasionally you're going to get numbers way out here in the tails, but most of the time you're going to get numbers right around zero. But very, very rarely will you get exactly zero. And again, I'm just using dots to make a frequency curve as I go. Okay, so now in practice, again, we don't have access to the population. 
and we would measure just one sample from each group, calculate the mean difference, and estimate the probability, or p, that you could have gotten a mean difference this big or bigger if h sub 0 is true. Now this might seem counterintuitive, but bear with me here. So the probability of the data given that the null hypothesis is true is what this means. If the p-value, or the probability, is very small, then we start to get suspicious about the truth of the null hypothesis. If the p-value is small enough, then we get so suspicious that we actually reject the null hypothesis and therefore accept the alternative, alternative hypothesis. So if the null hypothesis is most likely false, that means that the alternative hypothesis is most likely true. And usually we set that level, that alpha level, it's represented by alpha, to 0.05. Okay, so we set the level of error, the probability of error, to 0.05, and that leaves us with a 95% confidence interval. Now, the decision about the null hypothesis is based on probabilities, meaning it may be wrong. Okay, in statistics, we never prove anything with 100% guarantee. There's always some margin of error. So alpha is the probability of committing a type 1 error. This is set by the researcher, and it's usually set at 0 0.05, although sometimes it's set lower or higher. Beta is the probability of committing a type 2 error. We'll look at these type 1 and type 2 errors on the next slide. And power, statistical power, is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. So statistical power is really important because the higher the power, and power is between zero and one, the closer your power is to one, the greater the likelihood your study has of rejecting the null hypothesis if it is in fact false. So power is equal to one minus beta. So the greater your probability of type two error, the lower your power is. Power is increased by decreasing noise in the data. Noise is a term for high variability or error due to a number of factors. And power is also increased if we increase the sample size of the data. Now here is type one and type two error. So if the null hypothesis is true, so if you're measuring mean differences between two groups, okay, again, let's take the biomechanists and exercise physiologists. You're looking at their BMI and you want to know, is there a difference between these two groups? Your null hypothesis is that there's no difference, they're equal. So if that null hypothesis is true and you fail to reject the null hypothesis, okay, so it's true and you fail to reject it, meaning you accept it as truth, then you made the correct decision, right? Yay, you made the correct decision. But if you rejected the null hypothesis, so let's say that for some reason in your sample, it showed that there was a difference and it said that it was statistically significant at the 0.05 probability level, but it just so happened that this was one of those 5% times when you got the wrong outcome. So you reject the null hypothesis, but in reality it's true. That would be a type one error, okay? You rejected it, you thought you got the alternative hypothesis to be true, but really that was a false positive. So type one error is also known as a false positive. Okay, it's, it's a, an effect when there actually is no effect. So a difference in means when there's no difference in means or a, a correlation between variables when really there is no statistically significant correlation or um, an effect in the experimental group that's different than the control group when really there is no effect between the experimental and the control group. Now on the other hand, if H sub zero or the null hypothesis is false, okay, so it's false and therefore the alternative hypothesis is true, and you reject the null hypothesis, then hey, congratulations, that was the correct decision. You rejected the null hypothesis and in fact that was supposed to be rejected and you accepted the alternative but if you fail to reject the null hypothesis, when it is in fact false, this is a type two error represented by beta, and this is called a false negative. Okay, so this is the case where there is actually a difference in means, 
but you fail to realize that, you fail to recognize that because of your statistics that you ran, and it just so happened this was one of those 5% of the cases when um, they led you astray, and there actually is a difference, but you say that there's no difference, okay? Or maybe you say there's no difference between the experimental and the control group outcomes, but really there is a difference. So it's a false negative. You're failing to see the difference or the, the actual real outcome there. Um, here's a great example. Type one error is a false positive. You're pregnant, yay. Type two error is a false negative, right? She clearly, hopefully, is pregnant, but you know, you see what the doctors are saying. It's funny. Type one error is a false positive. Type two error is a false negative. Okay, now to recap all of these things, let's say that at the 0 0.05 beta level with the 95% confidence level, we are accepting a 5% risk of making a type one error, a false positive, okay? That's the risk of making a type one error, of saying, given that the null hypothesis is true, we are accepting a 5% risk of it actually not being true. Then we perform an analysis and calculate P. We calculate the probability of getting the data that we did if the null hypothesis is true, okay? <clears throat> if P is less than alpha, which we set at 0 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. And if we reject the null hypothesis, then we say that the result is statistically significant. Now, statistically significant, you're gonna see those words a lot. It is from the word signify or signal. It, it is not necessarily important or meaningful, it's just it just signifies that it might be, okay? You might have a very, very small effect that's statistically significant because you had a sample size of 1,000 in each group, and maybe it is statistically significant, but maybe it's not practically significant. It's not enough of a difference to really be meaningful in the clinic or on the field or whatever type of research you're doing. It might not be practical, okay? It might be so minuscule as to be meaningless but it could still be st statistically significant. And on the other hand, you might have a practically significant difference that's not actually statistically significant in the sample that you're testing. So maybe your sample size isn't quite large enough, but you look at the difference anyways, and there's a huge difference, and it's very meaningful for the practitioner or for the clinician or for um, you know, the, the pharmaceutical that you're developing, but the sample size isn't there, and so it's not statistically significant. Now we need to talk about the difference between two-tailed and one-tailed tests. Now a two-tailed test is when we state the null hypothesis in such a way that the difference between means equals zero. So in this case right here, the null hypothesis, um, the mean of the first group minus the mean of the second group equals zero. Half of rejection area divided between the two tails of the sampling distribution. So we would look at a sampling distribution and we would cut off 0.25% there and 0.25% there. And that would be our probability of error. A one-tailed test is when we hypothesize that one, one condition is larger than the other. Okay, this is a directional hypothesis. And in this case, we hypothesize with the alternative hypothesis that one group is larger than the other group. All rejection area in one tail of the sampling distribution. So we have all 5% of it right there. So let's go 5%, 2.5 and 2.5%, okay? And none of it in the rest of this sampling distribution. Now, how do we apply confidence intervals? Confidence intervals are an alternative approach to the null hypothesis significance test. So you'll often see this null hypothesis significance test, or NHST, and this is the most common and traditional method of doing inferential statistics with these null hypothesis significant tests. But lately, with the increased use of Bayes factors and other techniques, we've seen uh, 
less application of NHST testing and more things like confidence intervals and Bayes factors um, being applied. So the approach is based on the same underlying statistical model as the null hypothesis statistical test. But instead of making a binary decision about the acceptability of the null hypothesis, we simply calculate an interval around which it is estimated that the population value truly exists. So instead of looking at the problem and saying yes or no, right, binary decision, it's either yes or no, either yes there's a difference or no we don't reject the null hypothesis and there's no, no difference. Instead of that we look at more of a sliding scale with these limits between which the population lies somewhere, right? And we have some sort of a level, so maybe these are 95% confidence limits, and it's somewhere within there that the population parameter lies. Now, how do we calculate a confidence interval? Well, it's actually not that hard if you have the standard error of the mean. So let's say that we calculate the mean, and we want to calculate a 95% confidence interval around the mean. So it's, only, it's going to be the mean plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error of the mean. And how did we get there? Remember that if we look at a Z table, and remember that the Z table corresponds to the percentage of the area underneath the curve at each of the Z scores, and we go out to 1.96, above and below the mean. So that's 1.96 standard deviations above the mean and 1.96 standard deviations below the mean. In between those two numbers lie 95% of the scores. Okay, and so that's how we got that 1.96. And if we multiply 1.96 times the standard error of the mean and we add that to the mean that we calculated from the sample, and we subtract that from the mean that we calculated from the sample, that gives us a range. So in this case, if our sample equals 50 and the mean equals 35 centimeters <clears throat> and the standard deviation equals 10 centimeters, then we can calculate standard error of the mean to equal 1.4 centimeters. We would write that as the mean plus or minus 1.96 times 1.4. which comes out to 32.3 centimeters to 37.7 centimeters. So what we're saying is we are 95% confident that the population mean lies between 32.3 centimeters and 37.7 centimeters because we calculated the sample mean to be 35, but we know that they're sampling error. And so we calculated the standard error of the mean and this is our 95% confidence interval. We are 95% confident that that's where the population parameter lies. Now we can also apply this to mean differences. So we just looked at calculating a mean of a sample and inferring the mean of a population. But what about differences between two samples? So let's go back to that BMI difference between exercise physiologists and biomechanists. Let's say that there is a mean difference of three kilograms per meter squared. And the standard deviation of differences is two kilograms per meter squared. That's what we calculated based on our sample. So if we wanted to calculate a 95% confidence interval to draw conclusions about the population of biomechanists and exercise physiologists, then we would just do the same computations. So three plus or minus 1.96 times two, remember two is a standard deviation, and that gives us negative 0.9 to 6.9. That's the difference. So anywhere from, uh, <clears throat> from one group being 0.9 less to that group being uh, 6.9 kilograms per meter squared greater. Now because that 95% confidence interval crosses zero, right, because because zero lies in that range, we would, in this case, be f we would fail to reject the null hypothesis if we were using NHST testing. Because essentially what we're saying is that there's no way for us to know if biomechanists are less than exercise physiologists or that biomechanists are more than exercise physiologists in their BMI. Because 
that range crosses zero, okay? So we don't really know which one is which. Now, if it was all positive or all negative, we would reject the null hypothesis, and we would say that there is a statistically significant difference if we were using NHST testing, or if we weren't, and if we were just using confidence intervals, then we would just use that confidence interval and say that there is a difference. Now that brings us to the end of our introduction to statistical inference and sampling error, confidence intervals, and null hypothesis significance testing. Now, if you had any questions, let me know down in the comments below. In the next video, I'll show you how to calculate the standard error of the mean in Excel, as well as 95% confidence intervals. So stay tuned to that. I'll see you guys on the next video. Either in my mouth or on my mustache. Now, I'm not sure if it's out. Can't believe that. <sighs> okay.